Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to discuss with you one of the classics of all time in biology. Now, if you if you know me, I'm prone to hyperbole on occasion, and uh, even that's hyperbole. But this particular experiment, uh, which is conducted by Matthew Messelson and Frank Stahl, it's known as the Messelson-Stahl experiment, is truly a classic, not just in my opinion, but in many biologists. Um, that's what this video is going to be all about, is a discussion of this experiment. And why is it significant? Why is it special? Because it, re it required the experimental evidence to show that when DNA replicates, it's done by a semi-conservative model. Okay, So a model is sort of a, a, a prediction of, of, of an event in biology. And if we, you know, according to Jim Watson and Francis Crick, the, when they looked at the double-stranded, uh, double helix molecule, polynucleotide, the base pairing suggested that it was sort of helical and that it was ladder-like. But they predicted uh, in their second paper that the molecule could replicate by simply opening up. And the two original molecules, now we're talking about replication now, the two original template molecules would then be paired up with the new nitrogenous bases. In other words, the new nucleotides in the cell or nucleoplasm would pair up with the originals. And so therefore, when DNA replicated, you'd have this copy right here. Let me go back to that. You'd, go, you'd have this copy and this copy. So you'd have two copies, replication, and both of these would be identical to the original parent molecule. And this is known as semi-conservative. It's called semi-conservative because the old is paired up with the new. And so it's semi, like half old, half new. So it's conservative, meaning, um, if you will, that you know, fewer mistakes would be made. As uh, Yoda always says in, in the Star Wars uh, movies, always two there are, a master and an apprentice. So there you have the old and the new, semi-conservative. So each new daughter strand if you will, is uh, made up of um, a parent and a new strand. And so you're like, well, we, we understand that to be the case. Well, Messelson and Stahl's experiment showed that this model was correct. And, and I'm going to introduce to you that there's a couple of other competing models, or at least there were in the 1950s. And so this is a picture of Jim Watson here. And so uh, a possible next step after determining the structure of DNA was looking at how the helix itself could be replicated. In other words, like the heart and soul of life itself, it's DNA replicating. So it's pretty, pretty important. So in their second paper, uh, Jim Watson and Francis Crick uh, proposed a hypothesis, but it, st it stated that until uh, Matt Messelson and Stahl showed it experimentally to be correct. And so essentially the template became, or one strand became uh, the template for the new nucleotides. As you can see, the new DNTPs are coming in and attaching to both sides of it. And so the two new daughter strands are therefore duplicates of the original, composed of an old and a new and an old and a new. So pretty, pretty neat. And so during DNA replication, the base pairs enable the original one to serve as a template. So if I were to attempt to draw this, I might say something like this. Here's the original template right here, and here's the base pairs attaching like this. And then as the molecule opens like this, this is a very simple look at replication. Uh, the nitrogen bases would be sticking out, and if I choose uh, a new color like green, it would be suggestive that this would be the way DNA is replicated. So new nucleotides coming in either from the cell or from food. And these are, of course, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. They would come in and pair up like that, and likewise in this direction like this. And so what you'd get is two molecules that were the same as the original. So each new DNA uh, needs to be made when whenever a cell divides. Um, I, I hope that's obvious because if a cell is going to form two cells, you're going to need a, a, a complete DNA for both of those new cells. And so the daughter cell has to receive a fateful copy of the parent's DNA. And so replication is certainly rather important. 
So experiments done in the in the latter half of the 1950s by this is a picture of Matthew Messelson right here, and this is Frank Stahl. They collaborated to support experimentally that semi-conservative model that was once proposed by Jim and and, uh, and Francis Crick. Okay, so this is the experiment that supports the semi-conservative model. And so how did they do it? What was the ex experimental setup? Well, they made clever use of nitrogen isotopes. And we'll talk a little bit about that as the video pr proceeds. But there's there's a heavy and a light isotope of nitrogen, nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15. And they made clever use of uh, a density gradient found in, in centrifugation. So they used a centrifuge and nitrogen isotopes to determine the semi-conservative model working with E. coli bacteria. So it's pretty cool. So in 1958, they, they published their paper, uh, which is now known as the messelson stahl experiment on the semi-conservative model uh, using um, bacteria and heavy and light isotopes of nitrogen. What's pretty interesting about this is that when they did their experiment, the stories suggested that um, other friends and colleagues uh, knew that what they were doing was of, of monumental importance to determine how DNA uh, was was being replicated. And then when they when the results were in, their friends pretty much uh, wanted them to um, to be in isolation and to stay in the <laughs> uh, stay together and finish writing their paper so that the world can. Uh, can see the the great results, and so when I mentioned that there were competing models, um, the correct model is the semi-conservative, as I've been describing. In other words, the original molecule, parent molecule, opens, and so the two daughter strands in the first round of replication are half of the old and half of the new, half of the old, half of the new. So these are two hybrid. DNA molecules, which are this, both of them are exact copies of the original parent. So this is the correct model, semi-conservative. But the, the competing ones, which are not correct, so I can, can make it really dramatic like this. So the conservative model is not correct and the dispersive model is not correct. The conservative model suggests that the original molecule somehow stays intact and the new DNA is basically just a, a copy of it, but they're independent of one another. And then dispersive, again, not sure how this would work, but it would be like bits of the old molecule and new and old and new. And so the two daughter molecules would be, some of it would be the older uh, template and the other one would be new. So it'd be kind of like a hybrid, like the semi-conservative. And so there, as we're gonna see during the video, the experimental evidence ruled them out. And so there's experimental evidence that suggested semi-conservative was correct and that these were incorrect, So, which is kind of cool. So the way semi-conservative, again, works is that the molecule then opens up like this, the old molecule like that, and then the new nucleotides come in and pair with it like this. And so this is the one that is correct. So the two new molecules are a combination of old and new, old and new, or semi, half old and half new. And so Watson and Crick's um, proposal of the semi-conservative replication predicted that when the double helix opened up, it replicated an old strand and a new strand. And so how does the experiment show that this is the case? Well, to refresh you on some fundamentals about nitrogen, nitrogen, um, is atomic number seven, which means it has seven protons, but it has varying numbers of neutrons. And in this case, it has uh, heavy, it has uh, eight uh, neutrons, and over here it has seven neutrons. So one species of the isotope, which is more common, is a lighter nitrogen. So it's nitrogen 14, is the so-called light nitrogen. And then nitrogen 15 is sort of the heavy. Okay, so this is the light one and the heavy one because it, it weighs a little bit more. Now, this is a picture of an ultra centrifuge. So centrifuge are, are pretty common. We have a micro centrifuge in my lab, uh, but this is an ultra centrifuge. And the way it works is that yeah, test tube or micro centrifuge tubes are placed inside the machine and it's spun around extremely quickly. And the more dense uh, 
a substance is, it'll move toward the bottom. Like for example, if you were um, centrifuging uh, whole blood, what would what you'd predict is that the red blood cells would go to the bottom because they're heavier because they have the metal um, iron in the hemoglobin. And then what you'd find on the top, uh, less dense, would be the liquid portion or called plasma. And so the more dense items go to the bottom. That's what I want to emphasize. And so in their experiment, what they did, Matt Messelson and Frank Stahl, is that they, they used the heavy nitrogen-15 and the light nitrogen-15. And they were able to use those things. And so they, they were able to know that the nucleotide themselves uh, contain, like for example, A, T, C, and G, contain nitrogen. And so if you were to grow bacteria, okay, so picture uh, your typical E. coli bacteria, sort of rod shape. If you were to grow bacteria, either in a liquid growth medium or broth, or you could actually culture them on a, a Petri dish in a gel auger. If you were to grow bacteria in a cultured, or in other words, grow them or culture them in a medium that contained just the heavy isotope nitrogen 15, ultimately what they'd be getting is heavy nitrogen 15 in their nucleotides. And so all their DNA, if you just let them grow and grow and grow and grow, all their, not, let me keep the color dark blue, just to be consistent with that. If you grew the bacteria, all their DNA would be dark blue. And if they were to then divide, and they do divide every about 20 to 30 minutes long in ideal conditions, what you'd find is that the next generation of bacteria would of course have only not dark nitrogen-15 bacteria, uh, nitrogen-15 uh, nucleotides in their, in their DNA. Okay, that makes sense. But then over here, let me just make this sort of a green color. I'm not sure if I have that shade, but right here, this green lighter nitrogen-14. The thought is that if you were to grow bacteria exclusively in the nitrogen-14, eventually they would only have nitrogen-14. Okay, in their DNA. So that makes logical sense. So, but check this out. If you were to grow them originally in the nitrogen 15, like this, okay, so here they are originally, and then you were to transfer some of the E. coli. So in other words, re you remove the E. coli and you put them in another growth medium that contained the lighter nitrogen. What you might uh, predict is that inside here is the, the light nucleotides. And so since they're looking for nucleotides in order to replicate, they would incorporate only the lighter ones in. And so in the first round of replication, you would get this sort of hybrid experience going on when you grow them. But it's like, well, that's the prediction that that's what would be happening. But how did they experimentally show that is the question. And so again, they put the, this is a picture of my, the centrifuge I have in my lab, but if when you put the tubes in the, in the centrifuge and spin them around really quickly, you could use either a micro centrifuge tube or larger Falcon, this is a 15 uh, milliliter Falcon conical tube. If When you spin a sample down, the more dense, as you remember, the more dense, let me see if I can replicate that drawing of, of this. And here's, here's the centrifuge tube like that. Let's do it like that. And so if you were to spin this down, the E. coli, and, and you know, you're not spinning at this point, getting into the little detail, you're not spinning the E. coli uh, cells specifically. What you're doing is once you grow the E. coli, you need to then pull the cells out. You need to extract DNA from the bacteria, which is actually fairly straightforward. And then what you do is you'd create the, the tubes actually have a, a salt medium inside of them. And the salt is then spun down and it's more concentrated, the heavy salt, I can go like this. So it's a lot of salt down here, less salt, and then less salt up here. So again, heavy salt, not so much salt, and then even lesser still. So if you were to take the, the, um, the E. coli that was growing in the broth of nitrogen 15. So this was the heavy one. What, what you'd find is 
since it's very dense, the DNA would move through the centrifuge and it, it'd be pushed to the bottom and it'd find a place where it was most comfortable with the density of the salt. In this case, the nitrogen 15 would form a band right here and I'll just write it out, nitrogen 15. So that's what it would appear if you were culturing bacteria just in the nitrogen 15. And then if you were to culture the bacteria just in the nitrogen 14, it wouldn't uh, move, it wouldn't move that far down in the centrifuge tube. It would stay up here because it's lighter, nitrogen 14 in terms of density. Okay. And so what's interesting about this is that, let me do one more. What's curious about this is that in the tube, I was mentioning when they transferred the E. coli from the 15 to the 14, if you recall, the prediction was of semi-conservative. So one strand would be old and then new, and the other one would be old and new. And so see if you can predict what that would look like. So it would be, if you, if you have your predictions correct, it would look like a combination of both of those. In other words, it would be right in the center because it was sort of a, a hybrid of both of those. And so the density of the DNA would be found right in the center during the first round of replication. Isn't that pretty neat? I find that kind of interesting. And so what you can see here, let's look at this model right here, the semi-conservative. So the first prediction is that the first round, it would be old and new and then old and new. And so you'd get that hybrid sort of right in the center. Okay. So this is like pure 14 and this is like pure 15 down there. So this is what the first round would be. And then if this, if the second round was complete, Okay, in other words, this is just a factor of time. So if you let the bacteria sit in there for, for a longer period of time, they're going to first divide into two cells and then into four cells. That, but there's many cells. So what you'd predict is the original template would then pair up and form a hybrid and a hybrid. So you'd get that line in the center. This is the second round of replication. And then you'd get two new ones because then this new... Uh, lighter nitrogen would pair up with the lighter one because you transferred the bacteria and so you'd get this you'd get nitrogen 14 and you get this nitrogen 14 15 blend right there and so what's interesting is the conservative model was ruled out because the conservative model if you're following this would have uh, in the in the first round um, here, let me show you a picture of this I have an actual picture of of this. And so the replicated strands after the first round of replication in semi conservative was that it was a hybrid. It was a combination of the nitrogen 14 and the nitrogen 15, and that's what it looks like right there in the middle. But then after the second round of replication, you get the middle one right there, and then one that's just pure nitrogen 14. And I'll refresh you back over here. So in the middle, and then in the middle, and then just the pure 14. And that's what the, that's what the experimental evidence um, showed. And so in the centrifuge, it showed that it was semi-conservative, and it's pretty neat. So the first round of replication uh, was a combination of the hybrid, but in the second, it was a hybrid and then just the 14 that was growing in there. And so the transfer was the cool thing. Like, starting them off for several generations and then moving them over, we're able to, to, to make this. And so this is the picture that I was going to try to draw, but I, <laughs> I wasn't going to be successful. What's interesting is the fact that that first round of replication rolled out the conservative model because the conservative said it was the, the original and, and then a completely new one. And that isn't, this is what actually was observed. So that rolled it off. But this dispersive model where it's sort of a, like a blend still possibly could be. But in the second round, again, correctly, we see the, the hybrid and then the new because it's semi-conservative. And then here predicts you'd only see it in the, sort of in the middle, a little bit higher up, uh, suggesting the new, more new nitrogen. And that is not what we see. And then this is not what we see here. Again, more darker band up here in the lighter and then that one original one. That's not what we see. And so this experiment is the, conclu this is the conclusion of the experiment. So it showed that the, um, the, the model, the conservative model was defeated and the dispersive model was defeated and the semi-conservative model was shown to be correct. And so it was 
during the second second replication, which was the was the conclusive matter because it didn't completely rule out the dispersive, but it was the second round of replication that totally supported the semi-conservative model of replication, and so it's now very clear to us that when DNA is is copying, the parent opens up, and then the new strands uh, are a combination of new nucleotides and old, new nucleotides and old. And so, pretty cool. And so let me conclude the video uh, with uh, a pretty neat animation um, that I found that sort of discusses this whole idea. Let me foreshadow a little bit here. Uh, you're like, well, what's going on? You were talking about growing bacteria in a liquid broth, but you can also grow them in, a, again, uh, an auger plate. Or a petri dish like this. And so, again, the Messelson Stahl experiment supports the semi conservative model of replication. The Messelson and Stahl experiment provides evidence for semi conservative replication of the DNA molecule, where the two parent strands serve as the template for synthesis of new strands. Okay, so do you notice how they're being grown on an exclusive nitrogen heavy medium? In this experiment, bacterial cells were grown for several generations on a medium containing a heavy isotope of nitrogen, N15. The DNA in these cells, therefore, contained heavy N15 nitrogen. So if you were to, um, again, centrifuge the cells at this point, they would come down here like this, because this is the nitrogen 15, just the heavy. The cells were then transferred to a new medium containing the normal lighter isotope, N14. At various times after the transfer, samples of the bacteria were collected. The DNA... That's important because at various times is when you can get the first round of replication and then the second round. So it's time uh, and is involved in that. ...was then extracted and dissolved in a solution of cesium chloride. So that's what you're doing. You're pipetting the DNA into a salt. The, the salt chosen was, uh, was the cesium chloride. The samples were then spun rapidly in a centrifuge. When the cesium chloride is centrifuged at high speed, a concentration gradient is established in the tube. DNA molecules move in the gradient until they reach a place where their density equals that of the cesium. DNA containing N14 moved to a position in the gradient determined by its density. So DNA containing N15 is denser than that containing N14, so, so it sank to a lower position in the cesium gradient. After one generation in N14 medium, the bacteria yielded a single band of DNA with a density between that of N14 DNA and N15 DNA. So a, a hybrid, semi-conservative indicating that only one strand of each duplex contained N15. After two generations in N14 medium, two bands were obtained, one of intermediate density, in which one of the strands contained N15, and one of low density, in which neither strand contained N15. Now this is a simplification. Of course, there's, there's two of them. There's two DNA because there's four cells after that. There's two of those and two of those. But you get the point that the second round is just this and just this. Messelson and Stahl concluded that replication of the DNA duplex involves building new molecules by separating parent strands and then adding new nucleotides to form the complementary strand on each of these templates. So pretty elegant, pretty awesome, pretty powerful, pretty Nobel Prize winning uh, experiment. And I think uh, accessible for an average person to, to comprehend. And so um, again, a massive uh, experiment and historic importance in the biological world, especially molecular biology and how DNA is replicated semi-conservative. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something about um, DNA replication. Thanks for watching.